Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for that, uh, for that very kind welcome. Um, and uh, may I also say uh, a huge thank you to uh, um, all of the people who have made our visit here today um, so welcoming, uh, so friendly and, uh, and so uh, uh, interesting in terms of uh, the technology, the innovation um, and of course uh, the great education that you, uh, you provide here at, uh, at Strathclyde. Um, and uh, very kind uh, to see so many people coming along, so thank you to you for coming along and uh, talking, uh, listening to my talk on uh, this subject here of uh, can Scotland seed a new industrial revolution? Now, um, when I thought of that title, I thought, well, as uh, David has just said, um, I am passionate about the future of manufacturing, reindustrializing. Um, and just making more things and exporting them. Um, but I also realised that uh, potentially I could be seen as a bit of a fake um, talking about uh, reindustrialising in Scotland um, as uh, not necessarily as somebody with a huge amount of experience of doing this directly in Scotland. Um, but uh, I do have a, a pretty good sort of UK-wide view which I think is okay, um, and, uh, and obviously the company um, which I represent here in the UK has a very good global knowledge of what happens in manufacturing globally, so hopefully I'll be able to bring some interesting insights into also how some of that affects the industry here in, uh, in Scotland. Now, manufacturing um, and the wider engineering, so whenever I say manufacturing, I'm sort of talking the wider engineering sector, it will for sure continue to be essential if Britain and of course if Scotland wants to carry on and grow and indeed compete much more on a, uh, on a global uh, stage. And uh, it is particularly important um, if we as a nation are going to uh, rebalance our payments and are basically going to better be able to pay down our national debt, which both exists here in Scotland and when you take the nation as a whole. So in order to just address a bit of how we might do that and then to come back to the question of can we seed this industrial revolution, I'm just going to go through a few um, of these points here. So uh, I will go through just a very quick history um, of, uh, of Scotland's uh, uh, industry. Of course, you know that much better than me, but it was quite interesting for me uh, just to do a little bit of that research and link it also to uh, Siemens. Um, but then uh, I'll uh, quickly uh, move on to what increasingly is being called the fourth industrial revolution or many are calling it industry 4.0 and I'll talk a little bit about that, what it means to us and what it could mean for Scottish manufacturing. Um, moving on to a little bit of Britain and Scotland's industrial strategy where I see it today um, and then coming to the really important point which is what are some of the success factors if we really are to seed a new industrial revolution. So the Scottish Industrial Revolution, well, it obviously started at the dawn of the 18th century. Um, <clears throat> initially, it was tobacco, as you will know. Then it gave way to linen and uh, quickly moved on to cotton. And uh, by 1786, the new Lanark mills were the largest in the world. And uh, it clearly had become a huge industry, both on a Scottish, a UK, and on an international scale. But it didn't stop there. It moved on towards heavy industry. And by the end of the century, again, we all know the story that Scotland really was incredibly impressive in terms of leading the world in many disciplines of engineering, shipbuilding, and huge investment in iron, steel, and of course, coal. And uh, the real point for me when I was sort of looking through all of this history is just how incredible and remarkable it was the amount of innovation 
intellectual property that was coming out of Scotland into Great Britain, but also into the wider world. And I'm sure we'll all agree that in those days, Scotland was hugely punching above its weight. If you just take it in terms of sort of population size, um, in terms of what was achieved, was absolutely remarkable. And again, I don't need to tell you some of the great names, but there is a huge Scottish engineering hall of fame, James Watt with the steam engine, William Murdoch, and a little bit closer to our activities, of course, James Clark Maxwell, who we all know was right at the beginning and a lot of really the foundation of what is today our electrical engineering industry. Now, what I also draw particularly delight um, to uh, informing you, because I guess none of what I've told you so far was any particularly news to you, but what you may not know is that uh, James Clark Maxwell and the founder of our company here in the UK, they worked together and they knew one another. Our founder was William Siemens, um, and he founded our company here in the UK in 1843. He was a young engineer, came to the UK from Germany with a patent. It was actually a patent in electroplating. Um, and uh, he adopted Britain um, as his home. He actually married a Scot lady called Anne Gordon. Um, she was of Scottish descent, and she was the youngest daughter of Joseph Gordon, who was a writer, um, and he was brother to Mr. Lewis Gordon, who was a professor of engineering in the University of Glasgow. Sorry, wrong university, but uh, well, that's the only link to engineering I could find. Um, so, uh, so there you go. Um, and uh, William Siemens, he did become a, uh, a British subject, um, and he was later knighted uh, to become Sir William Siemens. So there we have it, alongside the very rich engineering history of Great Britain, we also find a link to the great history of Siemens here in the UK. And I must say, I really do think when you look at all of these people, Sir William Siemens, James Clark Maxwell, just their sheer ambition and their sheer achievement is something that I just find really quite remarkable, and that is something which I'm going to come back to later on in my lecture. But today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to be able to lead the Siemens organisation here in the UK. Um, we employ 14,000 people. Um, about half of them have engineering uh, disciplines and education, and uh, about 900 of those people, we're pleased to say, are working here in Scotland. We have 13 factories in the UK making things, innovating things, and exporting things. Sadly, none of those, at least yet, um, are in Scotland. Maybe one day we'll be able to uh, change that. And interestingly, pretty much all of those factories all have arisen out of some innovation or technology that has come out of some technology partnership with a university um, in the places in which we have those factories. So we've been around in Britain right the way through the second and the third industrial revolution, which I'm going to spend just a very short amount of time on, and we'd certainly like to be around as part of this fourth industrial revolution, which I'm going to be talking about in a little bit more detail. And uh, indeed, I think it's a very exciting time to be talking about this fourth industrial revolution, because sort of seven years, but over seven years after the financial crisis, I do get the sense that Britain is finally waking up to the fact that we need get to get back to industrialization, making more things. Of course, financial services are important, but they can't be all of our economy, and we have to make sure that we're innovating more, making more things, and exporting things. And so the question that I do ask in that race to reindustrialization, where will Scotland be in that, and how well will Scotland fare in building that new industry? So let me just quickly um, go through a little bit the last industrial revolutions before moving on to this fourth industrial revolution. And again, I'll weave some of uh, Siemens's and Scotland's activity into that history very briefly. 
We've already, I think, pretty well described the first industrial revolution. We all know that that was the beginning of hydropower, which really rev revolutionized the production of the cotton and the linen in those days. And of course, people like James Watt were absolutely key to that. And we all know that as the first industrial revolution. I uh, also learned that uh, uh, John Knox, who uh, was of course very key on, key on uh, Scottish culture back in those days, um, also uh, said that uh, Scotland had another huge great advantage in terms of just the high level of literacy and numeracy, hence global communication skills, which helped Scotland with its global reach. And I particularly find that interesting because whenever I come up here, I can't understand what half of you are saying. But, uh, um, but nonetheless, clearly, um, you did manage to communicate rather excellently across the world. So moving on to the uh, second industrial revolution, which was clearly the rise of electrical engineering. We started to see the beginning of mass production. And uh, we carried on seeing the great Scottish inventors going into this um, second industrial revolution. There was uh, James Beaumont Nielsen um, and his hot blast process, which greatly reduced the cost of producing uh, pig iron, which of course was very key to this industrial revolution. And what was very interesting here is when you dig into the Siemens archives, is that uh, um, our founder of our company, William von Siemens, he actually invented the Siemens open hearth furnace. It was a new steel making process that competed with the Bessemer steel making process. There was two reasons why that was required. One is, is the quality um, of the uh, steel that was coming out of the uh, Bessemer process wasn't quite good enough for heavy scale construction. And also people wanted a bit of competition for Bessemer because he was um, asking for a bit too much money for the licenses for his process. So that's where Siemens came in. And really quite amazingly, the Siemens steel making process was the first steel of the high enough quality to be able to build major bridges. And indeed, the fourth railway bridge was the first major structure in Great Britain that was built with steel produced by the Siemens open half steel making process. So quite incredible uh, histories that were going on uh, back then. And uh, sort of we went on to do some pretty great things in 1869, Siemens laid the first India-European telegraph link, so that was running from London to Calcutta, and uh, I guess it also went up to Scotland at some point very soon afterwards, and I would assume that at the end of those telegraph poles were lots of telephones invented, of course, by your very Graham Bell. So again, Siemens meets Scottish technology. But we move on to the uh, third industrial revolution, and I guess this is really where sort of Siemens started to have a, uh, a very significant impact because this is when IT started to have an impact on factories. The first industrial controls were invested, and it was actually quite late on through that period, sort of only in the 1980s when the first microprocessors were invented that we were able to create our first Siemens programmable logic controllers and those found their ways into factories and started to improve the efficiencies and the productivities of factories. As a matter of fact, I remember in my production engineering degree in those 1980s, I was working on one of those very early microprocessors. And when you think about the lack of processing power you had to do back in those days compared to today, it's actually quite unbelievable. Now, unfortunately, something quite sad was happening by this point in uh, British manufacturing, and that is that uh, our manufacturing footprint in the UK was dropping off at quite a fast rate. We'd sort of lost our edge in terms of innovation. So all of those great inventors I were talking about, somehow we weren't replacing with new ones. And uh, you know, we in this room, I don't think, really need a lot of reminding of uh, how bad it started getting. We know that the relative share of manufacturing back then was sort of 30% of GDP. Today, it's more like 10%. 
We know that we employed 9 million people in manufacturing back then in the United Kingdom. It's 3 million today, etc., etc., etc. And it wasn't all so good. But let's not look too back and depress ourselves too much because this lecture is going to be more about moving forward and in terms of what we need to do to hopefully get back in to the race in this fourth industrial revolution. And before we do that, let's just have a look at what some of the key drivers of change are that might allow us to get back in to this industrial revolution. And I think there really are some opportunities here for Great Britain, for our innovation that we have here. So, and the first driver is, is clearly just the speed at which innovation is happening in engineering and manufacturing environments. So, you know, we are increasingly seeing collaborative robots in some of our factories, and I'm beginning to see them in more factories as I visit them. Obviously, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, all these sorts of technologies are massively changing what happens in a manufacturing environment. And clearly, manufacturing companies are therefore having to just innovate at a much faster pace, having to invest more in R&D and, and having to have much more collaboration with technology innovation centres like the one that we are standing here today. And I think that is something which we in developed economies are going to be very good at. So I think we have an opportunity with our great British universities and of course this one here to be able to do a lot of that um, in a very collaborative in a very collaborative way. And, uh, and indeed, in my visit here today, I have seen Strathclyde playing very much a leading role in that because this new revolution is definitely all about collaboration. There is no company in the world, you know, and we have some pretty amazing R&D inside Siemens, researchers, innovators in factories all over the world and here in the United Kingdom. But we know that we're not going to be able to innovate enough and fast enough on our own, so we have to form more collaborations. And centres like the Technology Innovation Centre here, I visited the Advanced Forming Research Centre this morning, another one of those centres. I also went into uh, CMAC, the uh, Centre for Continuous Manufacturing here in this building. And these are all amazing facilities which are helping industries like ours collaborate and drive forward innovation in our factories based here in uh, the UK. The second uh, key driver of change is this move towards customization. I mean, people have been talking about this for a long time, um, but actually it hasn't been coming at quite the speed, um, but we're beginning to see it more and more. And basically, that is uh, being able to produce products at a batch size of one, but doing that at mass production prices. That is the sort of challenge that we have in this new customized world. And obviously that needs a lot of flexibility, much faster design cycles, and ultimately it's going to need a huge amount of technology to help you manage that sort of a production process. And that brings me to the third um, key driver for change, which is actually a key facilitator to be able to enable this new type of manufacturing, and that is digital business. Whatever you want to call it, whether it's the internet of things, big data, mass automation, you know, all of these things are ultimately the facilitator for a new personalized type of production. And uh, this will enable customers to be able to, you know, literally personalize exactly the product they want. And of course, you know, obvious ones would be uh, cars, uh, but it can be, it can be anything. It can be clothing, the things we wear, you know, personalize them to the level and then have them produced in a factory, probably a factory that you can even look inside with a webcam and see your product being made. And obviously it's shipped with very short lead times uh, to, uh, to yourself. And of course, the other challenge that that brings with it is the whole way in which manufacturing is going 
going to need to be better networked, the way supply chains are going to need to work much closer together, and the way the digital backbone, the way the sort of the data and the information is going to enable the connectivity between those supply chains, which of course also don't all have to reside in the same place. And uh, I guess that brings me on to uh, Industry 4.0, because what I was beginning to describe there is really the advent of this fourth industrial revolution. Um, it was uh, Germany um, that called it Industry 4.0, that's why it's spelt the German way, um, as opposed to uh, the uh, British way. Um, and this has really turned into a huge, initially a sort of a, uh, a German industrial strategy, if you like, um, but uh, um, it is going global um, rather fast and uh, many research institutes, as a matter of fact, in my visit here today, I heard it mentioned several times in terms of the possibility to link into the technology around Industry 4.0. And the ambition here is huge. So, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a collaborative program uh, started in Germany, as I said, between government, between academia and between business. And they've set themselves a goal to increase productivity by 50%, which is uh, pretty significantly. And, uh, you know, just um, to put some further flavour on that, German manufacturing productivity today is roughly double that of UK's manufacturing productivity if you just measure it in terms of output per head, which is a bit of a crude measure, um, but it does give you some flavour. So, you know, there is some work to do in that area. I've already mentioned batch size of one at mass production uh, prices. And the other interesting thing is, is a lot of people think of this, you know, this is potentially going to destroy even more jobs in manufacturing, but actually all of the people who've done economic researches uh, on this say that actually it will increase employment. And the good news is, of course, we're moving from lower skilled jobs to higher skilled jobs. So ultimately the value to an economy is actually very significant. But, of course, it will be a little bit about who gets into the race first. Because those who are in the race first will be the people who will benefit not only from attracting more of that manufacturing, but also they will be the countries that will be able to deliver a lot of the enabling technology. So whether that's digital technology, software technology, in order for that industry to happen. And, uh, and I can tell you that... Germany um, has got a strong eye at continuing to be a strong leader in that area and certainly being at the lead of this revolution as it, uh, it develops. But what is uh, Industry 4.0? So, uh, you know, we've all heard of the Internet of Things, we've heard of the Internet-enabled fridge and uh, all of these uh, fancy uh, things. But this is where the Internet of Things really comes into uh, the uh, factory floor um, and we are basically seeing self-organizing factories so where you know production items are going through a shop floor the production items to be machined or manufactured have got intelligence built within them so they have a, uh, a microchip within them and the product that has started off down the manufacturing line take my simple example of a car the chassis will have the intelligence built within it and basically it will be receiving and transmitting information from machine tools and robots within the manufacturing environment and it will move its way through production according to where it knows that there is capacity and which machine cell has capacity to carry out the next manufacturing process on it. And there will be other techniques that will help with technology um, leaps, some of which is already of course beginning to happen in our factories we're using visualization and uh, simulation, so simulating things before you put them into manufacturing processes much more. And all of these technologies will also help enable us to build factories faster and ultimately, actually, you know, you'll be able to, you know, once you've designed one of these factories, you'll be able to almost sort of lift and drop it and say, right, you know, that one was quite good here in Strathclyde, you know, but we fancy another one in, uh, uh, in somewhere in, uh, in Germany or in China and we just sort of do a cut and paste um, and, uh, and these factories will work. And actually, there will be another trend, I think, which is that uh, 
You know, these factories will be so flexible that you may not even need to have factories who are focused just on, you know, one product family or one type of product through which they gain their productivity through scale. You'll be able to, you know, have sort of what we would call a zebra factory. So it can make, you know, one component and something completely different, maybe not completely different, but certainly of the same sort of machining requirement type that you will be uh, able to manufacture. So, um, that's just a little bit um, of, uh, of what the, uh, the, the, the flavour um, of that is. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing is, is that this whole Industry 4.0 and the data that is collected in the manufacturing process will also help optimise the life cycle, the service activities of the products that will be manufactured and maybe here it's quite useful to use an example of wind turbines because that's something we've spent quite a bit of time talking about today um, with uh, your wind energy activities here in uh, in Strathclyde and uh, you know we already are but we will increasingly see you know totally intelligent um, wind turbines that will automatically compensate for wear and tear you know the blades on uh, turbines do wear and at the moment when they wear a bit too much you know you have to go on and a person has to go out and you have to do a bit of adjustment all of that sort of thing will happen with automated sensors and automatic adjustment using also a lot of information and data of uh, of what's around the environment and indeed that sort of what we call a autonomous uh, learning in a uh, complex environment is something which we are doing research with with uh, a number of uh, universities and from what I've seen today there's uh, I think an opportunity to do some more of that with your uh, with your activities uh, here and indeed um, it's not like we're not doing anything. We are funding um, a couple of uh, PhD students, for example, um, in uh, the uh, Wind Energy Centre here to begin to help us with that, uh, so that type of work. So that's a little bit about what Industry 4.0 might look like. And uh, let me now move on just really very briefly to the global landscape. Uh, because I think this is particularly important because we aren't the only nation who has woken up to the fact that we want to reindustrialize and we want to uh, make more. So on the left hand side, I won't go through them all. The top left, there's this industry 4.0 I've already talked about, but the USA has got its uh, um, um, manufacturing innovation program. President Obama launched that. They have a, uh, um, an October sort of uh, manufacturing week where they celebrate manufacturing. Germany, again, we have a very strong uh, Fraunhofer innovation uh, center type approach, which is what we're beginning to see more of in centers like this here in Scotland and across the wider Great Britain. In France, um, there is the uh, Nouvelle France Industrielle, and that was also launched by Francois Hollande. In China, we've got Made in China. In India, we've got Make it in India, etc., etc. And you can imagine an organization like Siemens you know, it is looking at all of these activities with interest and saying, you know, where could we do a little bit more of our manufacturing, more of our R&D and more of our innovation. And therefore, it's a good news that uh, we uh, have begun to pay more attention to what is happening here in the UK around the UK government industrial strategy. And of course, here in Scotland, you have quite a number of activities in that area too, which I'll come back to in, uh, in a moment. So all in all, we, uh, you know, we're quite encouraged as Siemens of what's beginning to happen here. And I have to say beginning because remember, you know, we've been sort of uh, relatively late to, uh, to, the, uh, to the new momentum that we've uh, been creating in this space. But the good news is we are seeing some results. You know, we are seeing companies invest in their manufacturing here. You know, it's nice when you fly into uh, Glasgow Airport and you drive past Rolls-Royce, which is, of course, very closely wor working very closely with you um, as, a, uh, as a university on their manufacturing further 
down in England, you've got companies like Jaguar Land Rover investing heavily in uh, uh, new uh, engine uh, manufacturing facilities. And of course, we as Siemens as well announced, as I'm sure many of you will know, that we are building, as we speak actually, um, our uh, blade manufacturing facility in Hull uh, for the offshore shore wind turbine market. So, you know, it's uh, all in all looking uh, quite uh, encouraging. And the good news is also that it's not like all of British manufacturing has disappeared. That's not true at all. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, here in Scotland, I've got the number here, 36.4 billion um, is the uh, GVA that was created by uh, Scottish uh, manufacturing that broadens out actually into uh, into wider engineering sector but you know it's a very significant number um, and um, it is also the sector that creates the most uh, innovation and R&D as a matter of fact uh, in Scotland if I've done my uh, research right then it tends to be the manufacturing sector that on average invests about double the amount of money in R&D and innovation than the broader uh, economy. So clearly manufacturing matters here in Scotland, it matters for the wider UK economy. But there are a few challenges and uh, if we just stick with um, the amount of money that is invested in R&D and innovation and this is the combined amount of R&D that is spent by government, so in Scotland, that is Scottish government, plus any money that comes in from UK government, plus the investment of the private sector like Siemens, then actually the Scottish number, I only make that it's 0.6% of the total of Scottish GDP in terms of innovation and R&D spend. And if you're going to be a major industrial nation, that just isn't enough. And indeed, um, it isn't that much better across the wider UK. It is, well, actually it's quite a bit better, but it's still not good enough. It's just over 1% if you take that same number across the whole of the uh, United uh, Kingdom. And if you compare that uh, to uh, some other economies, like, let me just pick Germany, it's about 6% in Germany. So, I mean, it's just a completely different scale. Um, now, you know, I don't think we're going to get up to 6% um, any time quick, but certainly in my role as uh, non-executive of uh, biz, you know, I do constantly say that we do have to push this number up quite significantly. You know, I think uh, at least a sort of 2.5% target over the next decade, I think, would be a good one to achieve. And then what we have to do, given we haven't got the luxury of a much bigger spend, is we just have to focus it a lot more on the sorts of things that we really know that Great Britain and Scotland can be really, really uh, brilliant at. And I think that moves me on to uh, what I see as some of the success factors for really creating a new industrial revolution here in Scotland. And indeed, I am talking here also about the wider Great Britain. And the first area is this area of industrial strategy. I think if we're going to have the luxury of less R&D and innovation spend, although I should caveat that what the UK is brilliant at is actually at converting that money that goes into R&D and innovation into, you know, into output brackets, we've not been that brilliant at then commercialising it into, pro uh, into product, that's another story. Um, but, you know, we have been quite good at turning input into output. But given we can't have masses more of money going into it, we're just going to have to um, focus more on, uh, on what we do. And I think that that is something that uh, we just have to make clearer because, you know, when you think of companies like Siemens and, you know, and we're just one example of an inward investor. And by the way, I'm absolutely clear about what the role of a prime manufacturer like Siemens is. You know, we're very often just the catalyst. And in the end, much more of the value that is created is in the supply chain that ends up supplying us. But, you know, countries like Scotland and like Great Britain, they have to show companies like us, you know, what is it 
that uh, we are going to be really world beating at. And when I sort of look a little bit outside in, and I look at our German board, you know, there is a little bit of a confused picture. There is a national industrial strategy. Then here in Scotland, I found a uh, can-do um, initiative. Then there was an initiative, another initiative of reindustrializing Scotland for the 21st century. Um, and uh, David uh, kindly, because I hadn't uh, picked it up yet, but uh, gave me a copy which I uh, had a quick read of of the uh, manufacturing uh, future for Scotland review uh, by uh, John Swinney so another review and just you know and these are all good things when you read them all as a matter of fact I did read uh, the John Swinney uh, review or at least the actions and a lot of them are going to be similar to what I'm talking about here but it's just how does all of this hang together how is this supportive of what's happening in the wider Great Britain and there is a lot of opportunity for very good collaboration and by the way I do see some of that going on but I think it just all needs to hang together in a clearer way and there needs to be a clearer set of what the priorities are so that Siemens can say these are the areas that we're going to invest in because this is where either we are or we're jointly going to become world leading. We do, by the way, think that uh, wind power is one of those areas where uh, the UK has a tremendous opportunity, but it has to be done by working in collaboration with quite a number of uh, institutes and universities like this one here. And the other interesting thing is, is that whilst we've got all of these initiatives going on, which like I say are all great, but probably a little bit of a muddle to somebody looking in from the outside in. Germany is pushing ahead with its industry 4.0. And the question that I've often asked policymakers is I say, do you really think that there is people sat in rooms in Germany talking about the Scotland can do initiative um, or about the British industrial strategy? And I'm afraid to say the answer is not really. Yet we here are talking about Industry 4.0, they're talking about Industry 4.0 in China. And why has Germany been able to do that? It's because they've just focused their attention on one major initiative to which everybody has got behind in academia, in the public and in the private sector. And I do think we have some learning to do from, uh, from that sort of a uh, focus. The second area I've uh, already, I think, really talked about, which is uh, driving up uh, innovation and uh, and uh, and R R and D. Um, you know, so I've already said it's uh, not um, high enough in terms of uh, the amount of investment uh, that we do here. And by the way, I'm also a person that doesn't always uh, throw the blame here at government and policymakers. I do also sense from the private sector here sometimes, you know, a little bit too much of a culture of, mm, you know, I'm not, I think I'll just wait another year before I make that next bit of capital investment and invest in the future um, of uh, my, uh, my own industry. So, you know, there just needs to be a greater level of ambition and uh, partnership in terms of investing in, uh, in manufacturing. And that is why I'm also a huge supporter of institutions like this and the high value manufacturing catapults like the uh, advanced forming uh, research center that I've seen here because those sorts of ecosystem, those sorts of places are great places where large and small companies can come along, work together and we can together create more R&D and innovation. And we need to do a lot more of that uh, here uh, in, uh, in, in the UK. The third point, um, I uh, don't think I need to talk about too much uh, when I'm addressing um, a, a group of uh, uh, largely uh, uh, academics, although I know there are quite a few uh, um, industrialists in the audience also. But, you know, this sort of skill shortage that we have in the UK is, uh, is pretty uh, well uh, documented. I personally think the biggest issue we have um, across the wider UK, I can't specifically see the picture so well in Scotland, but across the UK we have a huge issue of not having promoted the vocational routes enough. You know, when I look at the people we employ from Siemens and I sort of compare graduates to, uh, to the people coming through vocational routes, I actually generally say we get brilliant graduates. Um, and we have a very uh, good 
um, experience and indeed we have lots of good partnerships with uh, universities but we languish behind when it comes to uh, further education apprenticeships and just another startling statistic is that uh, my take is is that 17 percent of uk school leavers go into some form of a vocational route so an fe college um, or a formal apprenticeship that has been rising in the last few years which is good news in germany that is uh, 60 percent um, and uh, you know it really shows when you go into especially small and medium sized engineering organizations in Germany. So I think we need a stronger, a more simplified uh, national vocational system. And I also think that uh, universities can work in stronger partnership um, with the uh, further education sector um, through you know, obviously the apprenticeship route, but then higher apprenticeships. And uh, we're now talking about degree apprenticeships, you know, and making sure those things are aligned between the higher education and the further education sector. So um, let's just um, move on to the uh, next item, which is uh, improving the image of engineering and manufacturing. Now, again, I don't think there'll be many people here that will uh, disagree with me uh, on this. You know, when um, we've had a sector that really hasn't had the recognition that it's needed um, for a good three decades, I would say, happens to be the three decades I've been working in the industry. That was bad luck. Um, but uh, you know, we just we just haven't uh, talked it uh, up enough, um, and uh, we need to do a lot more of that. There are numerous initiatives doing that, and I think generally, I think we're doing a good job as Siemens. We engage in a lot of that, and I've seen that you do also in terms of engaging schools, etc. One of the things where we definitely need to do something about and nobody's come up with a clever answer yet is you know how do we reserve the title engineer to the profession uh, engineering it's it's a huge problem um, we uh, we have uh, in uh, in the uk and indeed there's been various surveys done about you know what do you think either to young people about a potential career engineering or indeed to you know, parents or uncles and aunties, all of which, of course, act as career advisors, and all of them are actually a bit confused by what a career in engineering really means, just because, you know, of the far too broad a way in which we've applied engineering to, uh, you know, pretty much anybody um, who uh, does anything uh, vaguely technical. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and please don't misunderstand me here, you know, I absolutely don't think that it's about, you know, engineers need to be held up here um, and vocational training is somewhat um, of a lower esteem. They both need to be absolutely high esteem and parallel, but there needs to be a professional status uh, to, uh, to the, prof to the, to the uh, professional uh, engineer. So that is something uh, that I think we're going to have to find an answer to, and, uh, and I've got no clever answer, uh, unfortunately. And then uh, finally, no, no, it's not, it's uh, nearly finally on this one, it's improve UK's relationship uh, with the uh, EU. Uh, and of course, um, I'm sure um, you would expect me uh, to, uh, to mention this in relation to this uh, lecture title. Um, and, uh, you know, because it is fundamentally important, especially to the manufacturing industry. You know, so, uh, you know, whatever anybody says in terms of all of this opportunity we have for trade in the wider globe, which is, of course, true and we need to do much more of. But the fact is that our largest trading partner is and will continue to be for many, many years ahead will be the EU. And my view is very clear that being a full member of the EU with that free trade and all the other supporting mechanisms and of course R&D and innovation. You know, we talked several times about Horizon 2020 programs today. You know, what would happen to our participation of those in the United Kingdom if we weren't in the EU? I can tell you what would happen. Siemens would still participate in them, but they'd participate in them out of Germany or France. And in the end, it's actually not about the money. A lot of people confuse this. People think, oh, you know, this is all about getting money out of Horizon 2020. Yes, that's nice, but actually the more important thing we're missing out on is the knowledge, the knowledge that is being created here in the UK that creates future industries. You know, and uh, <clears throat> I've listened really carefully, and as a matter of fact, yesterday I was in Brussels listening to people on both sides of the argument um, in terms of, you know, how we could do trade deals in or out of the EU. And, uh, you know, I'm firmly 
of the view that if we were to leave, it would be really, really extremely unsettling for a very long period of time. This notion that we can quickly sort out a load of tra trade deals in two years, I think is an absolute fantasy um, and would be something that nobody in the globe has ever done before. And I also think this whole notion of they need us more than we need them is quite frankly, somewhat insulting and arrogant. And uh, the truth of it is, is that we need each other and uh, you know and I'm a person who never subscribes well to a strategy where the only certain outcome is that both parties lose just seems completely bonkers to me but let's see uh, where it takes us but there is another important point which sort of relates back to industry 4.0 because another thing that I think people confuse is when we talk about these trade deals we're talking about the trade of today Actually, Siemens, in 10 years' time, will probably be trading somewhat 20, 30% of the products we're trading today in 10 years' time. This is about trade of the future. And this fourth industrial revolution is a key indicator of that. And I just can't imagine a world where Britain is not part of the R&D, the innovation, creating the standards for that industry and not part of it, but then somehow hoping from the sidelines we're going to have an opportunity to participate in it in a very significant way. I just don't see any way in which that could practically happen. And then my final point here is driving up leadership and uh, ambition, which is sort of a little bit where, uh, where I started um, when I talked about um, the James Watson, the uh, um, William von Siemenses, and uh, there's been quite a lot of research done on this. As a matter of fact, it did also uh, uh, register in uh, John Swinney's review about this whole issue of uh, leadership and, uh, and ambition. And I'm part of a national productivity review uh, by Charlie Mayfield, so I sit on that team. It's looking at productivity um, across the whole of the uh, United uh, Kingdom. And it's very clear that leadership and ambition is coming out as uh, a, uh, a very um, high factor. And this really brings me you know, right back to that point that I talked about, about uh, you know, that ambition um, within, and it is very often in small to medium-sized engineering companies to just make that next investment to be able to get part of a supply chain, whether that's with Rolls-Royce or Siemens or BA system or whoever it might be. And uh, we just don't have enough of that. And I can tell you from personal experience that when you know I used to uh, go around and be uh, more of a salesman and I used to call on engineering companies um, and then I went to do exactly that same job in Germany. I did it for four years in Germany where I was calling on engineering companies. And I can tell you the conversation was a completely different one you know here the conversation was always about risk of technology it was always about the commercials you know you were often talking to the purchasing people nothing against purchasing people um, you know but in Germany you know it's much more of a sort of an engineering led discipline and it's much more about you know I need to know about this technology because this is about me competing on a global stage and we need to be able to drive more of that ambition into the next generation of leadership and of course that's right back to here universities like you helping to make sure we bring that sort of leadership uh, into uh, the people we're educating uh, today. So uh, if I can uh, summarise um, and, uh, and, and conclude and uh, I guess come back to that question of uh, you know, can Scotland seed um, this uh, industrial revolution? Well, on the one hand, you know, I hope um, I've uh, said that uh, I do genuinely believe that digitalisation, this new way of producing, the fact that you can actually manufacture um, at batch sizes of one at very low cost. In other words, you can manufacture in a high wage economy at very uh, uh, economic prices, I think has got to be an opportunity uh, for, uh, for Great Britain and uh, for, uh, for Scotland. But the real question is, is uh, you know, are we able to be a leader in the pack? in quite a number of the things that I've been uh, talking about today. And again, there on the positive side, I say, well, I'd say that the conditions and the political environment have probably been better. Well, certainly in, 
in my 30 years of being in this industry in the UK, but I'm not sure we've completely seized the opportunity yet. But it is for our taking. And, uh, you know, I think what we need to do is we need to, as business, as academia and as government, you know, just get much more closer to each other, to get more strategic, definitely more long-term. And then I come back to this issue of we just need more ambition. Because if we don't do that, and we sort of carry on just trying to sort of compete with each other in terms of, you know, I'm going to compete with, and I won't name any names now, uh, but, uh, you know, this competition often goes on when it's sort of around collaborative R&D. We've just got to get above that. And we've got to say this is ultimately about really trying to find our race in terms of re-industrialising. And I think the time to do that is absolutely now. Um, and uh, we have to take that leadership. We, the business community, working with government and working with you in education. And with that, then we will invest more, innovate more and obviously educate more. I also already talked about particularly that being the case for vocational training. So really what it is I'm talking about, I'm going right back to, you know, the James Watts, the James Maxwell's, the William Siemens's, you know, it's their sort of ambition. And, uh, you know, where are we taking that ambition from today to make sure that uh, our next generation takes that forward for us um, and uh, really captures it. And I think that it is that opportunity and uh, really it is, it is up to us, I think, in this room to work together. And uh, so my concluding remark, I guess, is, ladies and gentlemen, let's make sure it's this, the fourth revolution that we seed, and let's not hang around and wait for a fifth. Thank you very much.